Hello, everybody. I'm Helen Shreves, president of Mad About Art this year, and welcome to our event with Georgiana, who is going to discuss monumental issues. To um, introduce her is Phyllis Vander Ark, uh, Hannah uh, who, Lichtenfels, who is our program chair. She will be monitoring the chat. Um, you all are muted and um, just unmute yourself at such time that questions, uh, we have yeah, new questions. So Hannah, do you have anything to say before uh, Phyllis comes on? Um, yes, let me just mention a couple of upcoming programs that you might want to note. Um, July 25th, we'll have the Sculpture and Garden Party. It's in the Baker neighborhood and we still have some room available there. So we'd love for you to sign up. You do need to sign up for that one. Um, that information has come through an email. We also have room on the Vail trip, August 10th through the 12th. And we've had some emails on that one. And then you will be getting an email on the Kit Carbler visit um, to his studio at Flux Studio, which is taking place August 19th at 9.30 in the morning, and we'll have two groups of 15 for that one. So keep your eyes open for that. And then just note that Georgina will pause periodically to take questions. If you don't feel comfortable unmuting yourself and, and stating your question, put it in the chat and I will monitor that. So thanks. Georgina, you wanna go ahead. Well, let, uh, let me have um, Phyllis Van Der Ark introduce George. It's it's my pleasure to introduce Georgie Contagulia, who served for a decade as president and CEO of History Colorado, formerly called Colorado Historical Society and the state's historic preservation officer. Earlier, she was curator of decorative and fine arts, managing seven house museums and curating many exhibitions including the annual Artists of America exhibition. She graduated from Bernard College of Columbia University, majoring in mathematics. She received a master's degree in art history from Hunter College in New York and worked at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and the Denver Museum. She has taught math and art history in New York and art history at Fort Range Community College in Fort Collins, Colorado, and the Academy for Lifelong Learning in Denver. She continues to serve on a variety of historic preservation boards and commissions, including the Colorado State Capital Advisory Committee, which advises the legislature on matters regarding the Capitol's art collection and historic preservation. And, uh, for those of you who were members of the Art Museum and members of our support group in the 70s, you'll remember fondly Georgie's time with us as uh, curator of the American Department. Thank you, Phyllis. Georgiana? Okay. Well, um, thank you for calling me a curator in the American Department. I was called administrative assistant oh. and I worked, I worked a big 10 hours a week and got I think slave wages at that time. <laughs> However, it was during the bicentennial and there were some really great exhibits that I was able to participate in when we were putting those together. So maybe you remember that Phyllis. I do. It was a, a great group and I enjoyed uh, the brief time that I was um, at the art museum. But history was calling me and I took a, a left turn, I guess, perhaps. Well, Phyllis, uh, I think saw my name in the paper when uh, there was a, uh, a bit uh, talking about uh, some changes in the art in the grounds following the, uh, around the state capitol and gave me a call and uh, asked if I would be willing to uh, give a talk to you about uh, what was going on there. And uh, I always like to put uh, the local uh, issues into a sort of 
uh, national or in this case, even global context. So that is what I'm going to be doing. So there'll be three parts to this and I'm going to bring up my slideshow. So uh, you can see me or not. I think you have uh, control over whether I'm a, a little thumbnail on your screen or not, um, but it's your choice. So here we go. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, Colorado Civil War Monument on guard, um, a little bit about the history, and Sand Creek Memorial. So this is one section. Uh, then we'll talk about um, vandalizing monuments. This is going to be a very, very brief history. And then uh, issues dealing with Civil War monuments. There's something in the news uh, virtually every day. And then at the end, uh, we'll talk a bit about um, what's next and where do these sculptures go and what do we do with them? So that's, that's the plan for uh, the next roughly 45, 50 minutes. So here's the first part. Uh, this is uh, the statue. The real name was called On Guard. Georgie, uh, yes. I do not see a screen here. Um, do you, well, are you going to your screen share on? I thought I did. It's uh, not coming through. Ah, all right. Hang on. I'm going to get out and come back. Always a glitch. Now, Helen and I went over this earlier. Okay, screen share. And, all right. No, that's not going to do it. Just a minute, I'll, I'll get it. I'm going to uh, minimize this and this. And bring this up. Sorry, Helen. No problem. We saw it earlier, so we know it's there. Okay, yeah. Screen share. There you How's go. How's that? Better? There you go. It's okay. All right, let me get the slideshow going. From the beginning. All right. And I'm going to minimize this so that'll get out of my way. Here we go. Okay. So, no. Here's the plan. I gave that to you before. Here's what we're going to do now. And here we are. Can you all see that now? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So this is the sculpture. On Guard is the official title of this sculpture. It is a Civil War monument, and it commemorates um, the first Colorado volunteers. This was a group that fought for the Union in the Civil War. They participated in one battle, uh, the Battle of Glorieta Pass in uh, New Mexico. Uh, the idea of the Confederacy was to try to gain entrance, let's say, to the gold fields in Colorado and California by taking over the Rocky Mountain area. And uh, the first Colorado volunteers joined forces with those in New Mexico and, and defeated the, the Confederates. So they with, withdrew to Texas and Arizona. The sculpture uh, was commissioned in 1906 by the state of Colorado. And it was designed by the artist John Dare Howland and cast by the Bureau Brothers Foundry in Philadelphia wasn't dedicated until 1909. And these are just three different views of the same sculpture. Here's a close up uh, on its pedestal and then in front of the Capitol. Um, these are two photographs of Howland. This is not a very good one. It came from a, a, a magazine and that's the best it comes up when it's scanned uh, by History Colorado. That's to keep you from ever stealing that photograph. Anyway, here he is uh, shown as a, a sort of beefed up uh, uh, scout. Uh, Howland actually was born in Ohio and as a teenager, he came west with uh, one of the fur companies, American Fur Company, 
and he decided he would look for gold in Colorado. He was not very successful as a miner. And so in uh, 1862, he actually joined the first Colorado volunteers and he served with them for two years till 64. And then he mustered out, uh, went to Paris to study art. And then when he came back, he became um, uh, secretary for uh, the Peace Commission in the West that uh, dealt with the Plains, Plains Indians. And during that time, um, he, uh, he also uh, explored work as an artist. He did work for Harper's Weekly. These are two drawings that were turned into engravings um, as part of the process and published in Harper's in 1867 during that time that he was serving as uh, uh, the secretary for the Peace Commission. So here, a uh, general one showing a, a, a peaceful gathering. Here are some pioneers and the Indian settlement. And here, negotiations between uh, some uh, Anglo people and the Indians. He also uh, did paintings. And um, I think the Art Museum has uh, at least one of his paintings. And you find them around. Uh, uh, in various collections and sometimes they come up for auction. He usually did um, like scenes of uh, Indians and uh, particularly the, uh, the uh, animals of the Great Plains. The sculpture uh, on guard was placed right here. This is the west, this is the west facing facade of the state capitol. We're looking at a bird's eye view here. And it was placed in a very, very prominent place right in front of the front door of the capitol. Um, the original location uh, was, of course, particularly chosen because it's on a hill and the Union soldier was looking out over the city and looking out into the distance of the, of the mountains. It was very, very dramatic. Here's a picture uh, shortly after the sculpture was installed in front of the Capitol. And I'm not sure what was going on, but all the photographers were using the pedestal so that they could take photographs of somebody. And somebody was taking a photograph back. And here we are in 2020 during demonstrations that were taking place in front of the Capitol. Um, Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, justice for, for all. Here's a Black Lives Matter. And nobody paying much attention to on guard here. I like to put these two together because it's quite a juxtaposition. The pedestal has a bronze plaque on it that lists the battles and engagements of the first, uh, first Colorado volunteers. And if you look down here in the lower right, it says Sand Creek, Colorado, 1864. And Sand Creek is noted on here as a battle. Well, it really was not a battle. It was really a uh, uh, a, a rout and a massacre because there were uh, on November 29th, 1864, 700 federal forces, federal troops, including the first Colorado volunteers and the third uh, cavalry, volunteer cavalry, attacked about 500 members of the Arapaho and Cheyenne tribes who were peacefully encamped near um, Fort Weld. Um, Colonel John Shivington led the soldiers uh, from Colorado, and the, uh, the, the Indian group included primarily women, children, and elderly uh, members of the tribe because the young ones were out hunting and doing other things, but they were camped along Sand Creek. Governor Evans uh, was the uh, leader of Colorado at the time, the second territorial governor. 
And uh, Colonel John Shivington was the person in charge of the first Colorado volunteers at that time. Um, it was shown in Harper's Weekly, and this is not a John Dare picture, and I, it doesn't say who the uh, artist is here. I haven't been able to find it. But it's shown as a battle with the Indians fighting against the soldiers. And of course, it was no such thing. In fact, Governor Evans had asked the Indians of Colorado to gather together near military installations. And so um, Black Kettle, who was known as a peace negotiator among the Arapaho and Cheyenne, um, gathered people together near Fort Weld. And they negotiated a truce there and said they would, um, they would be a peaceful gathering. Um, Evans, in the back of his mind, wanted to move the Indians out of the region because he wanted more access to mining in the area. And so there had been skirmishes in Colorado where the Indians uh, land when it had, the, the, the settlers and the miners in particular had encroached upon them, there had been skirmishes. So I think in the back of uh, Evans' mind, he really wanted to push the Indians out of the way. And in fact, the official um, Indian uh, land had shrunk tremendously. Uh, if you look at old maps, um, the Arapaho and Cheyenne have the whole midsection of Colorado is called Indian territory. And then as you look at other maps, that area shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And of course, now you know we only have the reservations in southern Colorado for the Ute. So Indian lands is gone. Point of this slide is in uh, 1950, when this uh, monument was put up, this was called Sand Creek Battleground. But when the National Park Service made it an official National Historic Site in 2007, they called it the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. So history gets retold. Just to show you on June 25, 2020, people who don't know history and didn't know that this was a Union soldier decided they would get rid of the soldier. And they pulled it down off the pedestal and they tagged the, uh, the pedestal pretty badly. So not that I would necessarily condone pulling down a Confederate sold, soldier statue, but the point is they had no clue what they were pulling down. They were just kind of following, I think, my opinion, uh, what other people were doing. Um, the Battle of Sand Creek or the Massacre of Sand Creek was very, very controversial. And uh, Shivington um, actually mustered out of the first Colorado volunteers by the time there was an investigation about this. Does it all sound like uh, MSNBC? We're going to have an investigation now, a congressional investigation. This was a, a, a state one, however. And Governor Evans um, was not uh, reposted as the territorial governor for a second term. All of this because of the Sand Creek uh, massacre and the issues that surrounded that. It was, it was pretty severe. I mentioned earlier that John Dare Howland had been a member of the first Colorado Volunteers. And as it turns out, he mustered out in October of 1864. And the, and the massacre of Sand Creek took place in November of 1864. So John Dare Howland was not a, a part of that, uh, fortunately. Here's another uh, June 2020. The um, uh, maintenance people at uh, the Capitol removed the Civil War cannon. Um, these, I think, think uh, had fought at Glorietta Pass for the Union. But because of the damage that had been done to the sculpture, they decided to remove these. They are, of course, quite valuable. And they were, we all thought, uh, uh, would be something that uh, the public might tag and, and do some damage to. 
Uh, uh, George, yes. let me say that um, in, in the paper, it said that Polis got, was outraged that the statute had been toppled and damaged and that uh, he it would be repaired and uh, that the people who were responsible for it would be held accountable. I'm not, no, I don't know yet if it's back up. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the people have been held accountable, but you're absolutely right to add that. The sculpture was repaired and it was reinstalled uh, temporarily at History Colorado. And here it is in the, uh, on display with some context as you see along here. And here's another view of the statue uh, at History Colorado. The ultimate uh, disposition of this, where it will go, ha there has been no determination that I know of at this time. In, um, I have to catch up with my notes here because I've gone beyond what my notes were. Um, in 19, no, in 2014, no, 2000, I don't know, around 2007, the Arapaho and Cheyenne requested that the plaque, the bronze plaque mentioning the Sand Creek battle be removed. And um, as you know, the state capitol grounds are, are part of a historic landmark district. And uh, the sculpture is of course, part of that district. Um, the state historical uh, society um, in particular, the historic preservation officer, and I was serving in that capacity at the time, uh, were asked uh, how we felt about removing the plaque on that historic sculpture. And we were not in favor of doing that. However, <laughs> my husband's in charge of the phone. Um, however, we, we did understand the Indian's concern. And so we all agreed that what we would do would be to put this in context. And there was an additional plaque added to the sculpture that uh, explained what the, uh, the business of the massacre and what had happened. And that satisfied um, the historical element. It also satisfied the Arapaho and the Cheyenne uh, tribes at the time. In uh, 2015, the Arapaho and Cheyenne came to the Capitol Building Advisory Committee with a proposal to install a, a monument on the grounds of the Capitol to, uh, uh, to monumentalize, to, to call attention to the Sand Creek uh, massacre itself. They chose Harvey Pratt. He's um, an Indian who was a descendant of someone uh, at, who was at Sand Creek. And this is the sculpture that he designed. There were other parts to it. There was going to be um, uh, sort of a, an abstracted teepee with the American flag and the white flag. This is something, this is a symbol that uh, Black Kettle put up during the battle when the First Colorado was coming in. He, he hung the American flag and the flag of peace underneath, the flag of surrender. And below that, you see a sculpture or a, a, a what's called a medicine wheel, which is uh, to uh, symbolize healing. So this was a proposal that came before the Capitol Building Advisory Committee. The uh, uh, advisory committee uh, approved it and made a recommendation to the state legislature to accept this for the Capitol grounds. And they did in fact uh, approve it. So there were some concerns about the safety of uh, primarily the, the medicine wheel and the, and the teepee part of the sculpture. And so there were a few little changes that were made. And so Harvey Pratt came back in 2020 with a new, uh, design, slightly new design. So here the woman has her uh, baby's cradle in hand. And uh, these are just different views of the Marquette. The sculpture has not been cast yet that I know. 
This is the site, this triangle here, that was the site that was chosen for the Sand Creek Memorial. And uh, this, of course, is where the John Deere Howland stood uh, on guard. But now that that sculpture has gone, there has been a proposal to put the Sand Creek Massacre sculpture there. And uh, the reason that my name ended up in the paper was at the meeting where this was discussed at the Capitol Building Advisory Committee. I asked the group if they wanted people visiting the Capitol, Capitol to see a memorial to a massacre as the primary sculpture as they entered the state capitol. Um, it was a rhetorical question um, because the committee voted to uh, put the sculpture there. And that's kind of where it stands right now. So I will stop here and I will ask if there are questions. No questions? If you have no questions, I think you weren't listening. I have, I have a question. Okay. What, what would be other options to put there if you didn't put the Sand Creek Massacre statue there? Well, the John Deere Howland sculpture could go back or it could be just turned into sort of a, a garden um, with maybe a plaque or a little, you know, little memorial, something small that uh, maybe wouldn't uh, cause people uh, to become agitated. I don't know what else to say. There wasn't really any discussion about other options. So if you have a good one, I'd be happy to listen to it. Other questions? All right, I'm going to go on. So we're going to talk a very brief history of vandalizing memorials. And uh, I'm going to start with an assemblage of uh, Egyptian sculptures. Um, and they all seem to have their noses missing. It appears that, um, well, I guess I, I should put it as archaeologists surmise that when a new pharaoh and the new dynasty came into uh, power, that uh, sculptures of the old pharaohs were often defaced, that being a way to uh, get rid of their power and to show that they were mere mortals, I suppose. Um, in uh, 2017, there was a huge, a colossal sculpture of Ramses II that was found accidentally in Cairo when they were doing some excavation. So even something as big as imp and important as Ramses um, got dumped. Uh, George, <laughs> yeah. my understanding of the, um, the nose missing on the, on the Sphinx yes. is that in the mid 1800s, the British troops would shoot at it for target practice. Well, makes perfect sense. <laughs> the Romans had a better idea and they made sculptures with removable heads that you could set down inside a sculpture and arms, I guess. And here is a close up that shows the woman's head down inside the sculpture. It would have a like a peg that enabled it to sit down in there. Um, this meant that if your sculpture went up because you were in the Senate, and then later you died and your son was in the Senate, they could take your head off and put your son's head on the same sculpture. Worked very well. It was uh, economical as well. But lest you think it's just in ancient times that these things happen, this is an engraving that shows uh, Americans um, pulling down the statue of King George II. I think that should be King George III by that time. There's always a typo that I don't see. It's King George III on, uh, in Bowling Green, New York in 1770. So the Americans have a long history of pulling down statues. And more recently, 
you probably saw this in magazines, um, the Buddha, uh, this giant heroic sculpture dating from around uh, 600 was destroyed by the Taliban 2001 in Afghanistan. We should watch the paper, maybe there'll be more. And in 2003, the group pulled down Saddam Hussein's statue in Baghdad. And if, I don't know about you, but I watched that one on TV. And as they say, when uh, Russia took over part of Ukraine, uh, the statue of Lenin was removed in 2016. And Edward Coulson, who was a British slave trader, his sculpture was pulled down and thrown into Bristol Harbor in England in June of 2020. Uh, this is, I think, part of the Black Lives Matter, Matter uh, movement. So there's a lot been going on with civil war and other memorials in the United States. Um, in recent times, in particular, um, because of, uh, I think, the 1619 um, issue of the New York Times and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, this came from the uh, National Geographic. If you can get a handle on this uh, February issue of 2020, um, it, it talked a lot about these uh, sculptures. Down here, the orange sculpture, uh, the orange marks on this graph show the years where Civil War monuments were erected, uh, starting way back here in the uh, 1870s. But the bulk of them are around uh, 1900 to 1920, this huge spike. And of course, this is when our John Dare Howland sculpture went up. That one went up 2009, so right in the middle of this, part of this big spike here. And then it kind of peters out. Uh, the initiative for these sculptures often came from um, the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy, United Daughters of the Confederacy. Uh, let me just point out these purple marks here. Uh, this is a different timeline starting 1989 up to 2020. These are when sculptures were removed. And you can see 2020 was a banner year for removing sculptures. This map shows where the Confederate sculptures were located and removed. And take a look, Colorado does not have one because of course we had a Union soldier, not a Confederate soldier. The one that we've probably heard most of is um, the Robert E. Lee Monument. And uh, this went up in 1917. It was part of that big spike in there too. And, and by the way, I have some statistics. There were, and this came out of National Geographic, between um, 1854 and, nine, and 2020, there were 824 Confederacy monuments installed 664 roads were named for Confederate people, soldiers, or battles. 192 schools, 240 other Confederate symbols were dedicated. And then, of course, these many of these have been uh, removed. So in uh, Charlottesville, this one became a real hot spot for uh, people on both sides of the slavery question and the Confederacy question. It, uh, it portrays the soldier on horseback. Now this was, uh, this has a, a, equestrian sculptures have a long history dating back to actually Greek times, but being mounted on a, a horse was a symbol of your authority and your power. You were the leader of the troops. And so they usually would show uh, the general on, on horseback. And even if you look at a, like a, a painting of George Washington, he's usually with his white horse. Again, this is to show his, his authority. So um, 
this, this one went up in 1917, dedicated a few years later um, after, um, and then uh, listed on the National Register in 1997. And there were four sculptures in uh, Charlottesville that were erected around the same time, and all of them were put on the historic register, National Register of Historic Places in 1997. This is uh, the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue in uh, Charlottesville. And that just happened in June. And again, because this is a, from a newspaper, the uh, pixels aren't great on the photograph. I apologize for that, but nothing I can do about it. And uh, more to show you the statue being removed in also, the park um, that it was in got renamed. Georgiana, uh, yeah. uh, yes. some cities have put these statues in uh, museums or something. Do you know what happened to the Robert E. Lee one? I don't. Okay. I don't know that. But uh, of course, our, so our soldier went into the museum, and that's, of course, one of the options. There is another statue in uh, Charlottesville. This is Stonewall Jackson, who is another um, general. And um, this is the dedication ceremony below in 1921. And this one was also placed on the National Register. And um, I think these have just been sort of put in storage for the time being. I think there is no plan about what to do with them yet, but at least not that I have read. And um, there's a Robert E. Lee Memorial in Richmond. And uh, here it is in its pristine condition. And here it is after it's been tagged. And they also um, projected pictures of uh, Floyd, who was murdered, um, and different, different black heroes, let's say. Um, so here it is before and after the death of George Floyd. The National Park Service listed this as the most, I don't know what the word is, effective use of a monument. It caused the most attention uh, of any uh, monument in, uh, on the National Register. There was uh, uh, a decision made by the city council to remove the statue and to rename this park, uh, Market Street Park. It had been named Lee Park. And uh, a month later, there was a lawsuit to block the removal of the statue. And um, this, I'm not sure just who brought the suit, but we can imagine. They said that uh, it by removal would violate a 1997 state law that protected America's Civil War monuments and memorials. Um, however, the city argued that the statues memorialized individuals, not the war, and that they were erected long before the 1997 law was passed, and the law was not retroactive. And so the judge said it could be removed, and of course it was. Subsequently, uh, in Virginia, there's been a bill introduced in the state legislature to protect Civil War monuments from removal or destruction. So I don't know how that one um, is different than the one that they had. Maybe it's not retroactive, or it's, if it is, it would cover the ones that are still uh, around. Um, this is another one from Charlottesville on the National Register in 1997 called First View of the Pacific. It's Lewis and Clark, and they have here uh, Saka, Sacagawea, Sacagawea, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and because she is seated and in sort of a subservient position, um, they decided that this one should also be removed because it was disrespectful of the uh, uh, Indian woman. And this was also removed June 10th, 19, uh, 2021. And this last one, 
uh, of uh, George Rogers Clark. He is called the Conqueror of the Northwest, actually the Conqueror of the Old Northwest. If you remember like Ohio and um, the Great Lakes area, sort of French and Indian War period, that was called the Northwest at the time. It was the Northwest from where the colonies were. It was before we went from sea to shining sea. So he was called the Conqueror of the Northwest. And uh, again, it shows him uh, in a powerful position. He's on a horse and uh, the Indians uh, being moved out of the area. So again, for the same reason, being disrespectful of the Native Americans, this was also uh, removed. So there's a huge sculpture in Georgia uh, with the images of Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jefferson Davis, all on their horses. And uh, it's a sculpture that was uh, initiated in vision, let's say 1912 by the United Dames of the Confederacy. Um, and uh, it was not completed, however, until 1972. And this is um, put into the rock. Here is a view, it's um, a large siding, a cliff, and it's been sculptured right into the cliff. Now, what uh, people might not know is the field in front of it was a gathering site for the KKK during uh, all the 20s and 30s and probably even before. And those who put up that sculpture knew very well that it had been a gathering site for the KKK. And uh, I'm sure this figured into their decision to put the Confederate lost cause people here. But they don't think of it as a lost cause. It's maybe, I don't know, never mind. So, question is what's next? And where do these go? That was a question someone just asked. Um, here in Denver, we, uh, we already, oops, let me go back, sorry. I wanna go back to our Pioneers Monument. On the very top, there was a sculpture of Kit Carson. The original plan had been to have a, a statue of an Indian, but um, the, people who were involved in the selection of the sculpture and the design um, thought that that um, gave too much importance to the Indians. And what they had been trying to do anyway was get the Indians out of the way. So um, uh, Kit Carson was put up because he was uh, a scout, he was a military person, he actually was in charge of Fort Garland here in Colorado for a few years. Just to show you, uh, part of that monument also includes a miner, a pioneer mother, and a hunter, pioneer hunter. In uh, all of these done uh, 1911. So at the peak of this period. Um, there was concern that that sculpture would get torn down. It's way up high. What would happen? It would get trashed. People could get um, injured or killed by it. And so uh, the city took it down. And I don't know where this one is either. In um, San Francisco, there is the James Lick Pioneer Monument. And uh, it has Columbia at the top. But the issue is this sculpture. I think that's the one. Here is a close up of it called The Early Days. It shows um, um, a monk, uh, uh, a missionary, the uh, vaquero here for, for the Spanish, and an Indian. Again, the Indian uh, is being converted by the Catholic uh, monk. And uh, again, uh, an affront to the Native American and to their culture and their religions. So uh, that one uh, has been criticized and was removed September 14th, 2018. Uh, the remainder of the monument 
the other pieces of it, uh, as with our own Pioneer Monument, those stayed intact, but this part was removed. In Chicago, the Columbus statue was removed in 2020. Columbus, of course, brought, uh, brought the white man, shall we say, to the New World. Um, he also brought many diseases that decimated the uh, native tribes in the uh, uh, Caribbean area. And uh, also the Columbus statue in Columbus, Columbus Circle, New York. Uh, there have been protests against that as well. And I just show uh, one of the banners that went up uh, because there's been a call to re remove that. I don't think it's been removed, but if anybody has been to New York, you might check it out. And the latest and greatest, this was in uh, this was in the newspaper just this week. I just had to add this slide. This is the sculpture in front of the um, American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt can't see him in this slide very well. On horseback with a Native American and an African man. Uh, so there was discussion about this. Uh, it was installed. It was. It was created in 1925, placed in front of the museum in 1940. And uh, when there started to be talk about removal, the museum um, developed a special exhibit uh, to talk about the various perspectives of this sculpture. And that's what you see here, pointing out what these people mean, why they were chosen, who they are, what they are, et cetera, et cetera. And um, then we have a Columbus statue in Pueblo. And as far as I know, that is uh, still here. However, we are no longer calling it Columbus Day. We are now calling this Indigenous Peoples Day. And this placard by this little girl um, tells us exactly why. So questions remain, what should happen to these statues? Should they be melted down? Should they be displayed in a historical context? Well, that's what History Colorado chose to do. And that's actually what the American Museum of Natural History in New York chose to do. Um, are they going in a special park? I don't know, but that's one of the things that's been talked about them. And uh, should they go in a museum? And Biden just this week mentioned that that would be his um, preference to put them in a museum where they, the various perspectives and the history of them could be um, put in. But the issues still are there. The question is, you know, should we protect historical artifacts? And if so, how do we do that? Internationally, what do we do for World Heritage Sites? They have cultural meaning. That's why they were chosen to begin with. And uh, what happens to them in periods of civil war or other kinds of war um, and destruction? And uh, there, there are many. The question is, who pays the cost of these things uh, when they have to be restored, when they have to be moved, when they have to be reinterpreted, whatever? There is a financial cost. But what is the historical and the cultural cost if they are destroyed or hidden from view? The big question, can we erase differences by erasing the art of different people and different ideas? And do we erase history by removing the monuments? Or is there still something to be learned by them? I have no answers to these things. I pose the question, and maybe we have a few minutes when we can discuss these. Georgie, can you, this is, can I ask a question? You may. How is the committee put together that makes some of those decisions about the monuments? And it, it depends. Um, in Colorado, we have the Capitol Building Advisory Committee, which is uh, uh, a group. Some people, uh, for instance, the uh, CEO of History Colorado serves um, uh, ex officio on the committee. There are always um, 
two legislators, um, Democrat or Republican, uh, one from the House, one from the Senate. Uh, other people are appointed. Some are appointed by the legislature, some are appointed by the governor. I have served in three capacities, one as CEO of History Colorado, once I was a gubernatorial appointment, and once I was a legislative appointment. So um, they try to pick people who have um, some interest in art, in historic preservation, in architecture, because uh, that committee deals with more than than sculptures. They deal with the grounds, they deal with the preservation of the building, et cetera. So they pick people from different uh, uh, specialties, let's say. In Chicago, they just established a, a, a commission to take a look at all of the sculptures. They're even looking at a sculpture of Abraham Lincoln as a young boy. Now, what could be wrong with Abraham Lincoln as a young boy? And he actually, as a grown up, freed the slaves, put a stop to the Civil War. But anyway, this commission is looking at all of the sculptures and they will have a report. I don't know exactly what their, uh, their, their job is, what their job description is. Uh, so different places, uh, the city council was the one who determined in uh, Charlottesville to take the sculpture down. Um, so different, different cities uh, do it in different ways. Uh, likewise in New York, I think it was the city council that, that did it. So. That's the best I can do on that. And, and does, does your committee make a recommendation and then does it need to be approved or? Yes, we make a recommendation and the legislature um, approves or not. Thank you. Um, most recently there was a proposal for a sculpture of uh, General Maurice Rose, uh, World War II sculptor, uh, World War II general. Um, and the sculpture is, uh, going to be designed by George Lundin, and that was accepted. But, you know, there's also the Vietnam Memorial there. There's a um, Korean War Memorial. There, there are many different ones in the grounds. USS Colorado has a memorial there. So over the years, there's been a uh, acquisition of these things. And the, and the question that our committee looks at each other and we say, you know, when is enough? When do we have too many? And the big thing is, you know, how do we take care of them? And um, the most recent ones that have come in, we've requested that there be money put into uh, an escrow account for ongoing maintenance of the sculpture because um, the taxpayers can't absorb all of that. In a good year, we could, but there are other ways to spend your money and we all know what those are. But it is the mayor that has cleaned it up after it's based, though, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. It is the taxpayer's money, though, that has to pay to have them cleaned up after they've been defaced, is it not? Well, if they're in the case of the uh, on guard, the answer is yes, because there was no money put aside for that. If, for instance, the General Rose sculpture in the future was de defaced, there would be some money for restoration and uh, you know that could be done but you know we sort of learned a lesson along the way that we need to have that uh, i don't know if you ever um, seems to be some uh, seem to be some feedback if you have ever been in berlin um, they have this fabulous memorial very unusual called, it's a memorial to the murdered um, Jews of Europe. And it goes, it's quite large and it goes around in a circle down lower. But there are no, um, there's no streets or there's nothing. There's, uh, as a matter of fact, the bunker uh, where Hitler killed himself is paved over as a parking lot now. So there's no monuments at all. And I think um, that as more and more things come out like the massacre in Tulsa, it's um, kind of, which I never knew about. And all these things are coming up more and more to show 
uh, the real sadness of having to, uh, for, you know, black person to walk by a monument of somebody who really just wanted to keep you a slave. I, I think that it um, just got more and more uh, beyond disrespectful. I certainly understand the Native Americans to have Sacagawea who basically saved their lives to have her be <laughs> in that very okay. humble, disrespectful position. Though it's more a matter of human respect and human okay. kindness, I yes. think more than, you know, a lot of things. Anyway. That's, you're, you're exactly right. I totally agree. But the sculptors wanted to show the uh, superiority of the white race. And that's why these were put up. The majority of them were put up during the uh, Jim Crow segregation era. And, uh, you know, Germany's had a very hard history to grapple with, and they have dealt with it, I think, fairly successfully. But it's just been in recent years under Angela Merkel that that's happened. Um, there, there are pieces of the, uh, the Berlin Wall, too, that right. are on, on display. So, you know, different, different, different countries, different communities are going to deal with these things as uh, what, what works for them. The but, Berlin, Wall, uh, Berlin Wall Monument is actually very interesting. It's a mile long. They took pieces of it, and then they sent a uh, a letter out to artists around the world and picked certain of them who got a piece of the wall to put their art. So it's really, really interesting artistically to walk down that mile of the Berlin Wall and see the art. Yep. Well, and there are cities that have um, plaques in the sidewalk to show a house where a Jewish family had been exterminated uh, to memorialize that family. family. Um, and, I, you know, there are, as it said, 800 something of these memorials around our country and how many hundreds of roads and how many parks and schools that were named uh, for people. And, you know, we have George Washington High School. So George Washington is under uh, fire, so to speak, because he was a slave owner. And of course, well, he, he, history is messy and it's complicated. Right. He, uh, he did free all his slaves he, on, on his death, but on, he, his, on his death. Yeah. His wife owned a couple and, you know, but he did, whereas Thomas Jefferson did not. So, right. you know, we can't forget those are the times, you know. Well, uh, it's part of the context and I'm, I'm for context myself, but yeah. not everybody is. Georgie, I have a question. Yes. Has, has there ever been a discussion regarding um, commissioning a piece of art to replace the, uh, the statue that was in front of the Capitol? I know money is spent, a certain uh, percentage of money uh, per year is spent on public art, but commissioning um, a piece that would be more abstract and would not be offensive to anyone except those who just plain don't like the, the abstract, abstract art. You know? <laughs> uh, that's a very good suggestion. Um, it, it did not come up for discussion because uh, the Sand Creek Monument was sort of on the launching pad, so to speak, and that was brought up and the group decided that would that would be it. Um, the percentage for art, uh, Phyllis, pertains to new public um, construction. So if they're going to build a new prison, a percentage has to go for public art with that, or if there's going to be a new state park, part of that has to be so it's not something that you can just take the money and put it into uh, the capital grounds it, unless there were some new construction on the grounds that would call for a percentage. So it's, um, 
the money would have to be raised privately uh, to do that. And I'll tell you, as many people as there are, there are as many ideas. You know, the, these are not easy things to grapple with. I mean, I, I do not have the answers. I have my opinion, but it's not necessarily the answer. Right. So it's just the way. I, I don't know how it's all going to come out. And uh, there are going to be more that are gone. And you're right, all this business of the, uh, the, the Indian schools. I mean, they were trying to eradicate the, the Indian culture. They did not let these children speak their native tongue. They gave them Anglo names, not their Indian names. They gave them new clothing, taught them as though they were Anglo children. And uh, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard and a very dark story. I know and it's just in the United, not just in the United States, but all over the world in uh, things. But fortunately, kindness and goodness and caring, I think, is going is still there as much as the the evil and um, and, the, and the anger and the anger. anger. But Georgiana, it's a little after five. Um, I think. Unless there are any further questions. Uh, There's nothing in the chat. Nothing. Bonnie, okay. did you have a question? No? OK. I think she okay. had put her hand to All uh, right. Well, thank you, everybody. OK. And well, Helen, Helen and Phyllis um, have my email. So um, should anyone want, I didn't think to put it in the, in the slideshow maybe another time but um anyway they can get a question to me if if something is burning but as you know i have no answers i only have questions too well you're a highly respected teacher and um people say wonderful things about you georgie and phyllis and uh, gary thank you for bringing georgie to our attention and hannah so we'll see everybody later and thank you Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you, Georgie. Bye-bye.